Segment 8b, Kepler and Kepler's Laws, Explanation of the Laws. Kepler's three laws are empirical laws. That is, they're distillations of the data without any physical framework. They provide a way of summarizing the observed results. Remember that Tycho took data for over 20 years, and what Kepler did was analyze these data and find a fairly simple way to explain the results that he got. Recall that an ellipse is a, a figure uh, that has two foci, and we define uh, the semi-major axis of an ellipse A as half of the distance along the, the major axis of the ellipse, along the longest distance in the ellipse. You can draw an ellipse by taking a string, and a, a string that's tied together, and putting pinning it at two at the two foci and then taking a pencil and moving around because one of the particular characteristics of an ellipse is that the sum of the distance from the surface itself to the two foci is constant and a string will accomplish this for you as you pull it around you'll make the ellipse. If you put the foci farther and farther apart compared to the length of the string the ellipse becomes more eccentric, more skinny. If you move the two foci together and keep them in the same place of course what you get is a circle. Kepler's first law states that the orbit of each planet is an ellipse with the Sun at one focus. He was very lucky that he was able to discover this because he started with the planet Mars for which he had the most and the best data and Mars's orbit is somewhat more eccentric, that is more elliptical rather than circular, than many of the other planets so it was possible for him to see this difference and to test it very effectively. But all the planets follow these paths. The Earth's orbit is very nearly a circle Comets in orbit around the Sun have very eccentric orbits with uh, ellipses that are, are, are very, very long and thin. Most of the planet's orbits are fairly close to circles. The second law, which you should note applies to the behavior of a single planet along its orbit, states that a line drawn between a planet and the Sun sweeps out equal areas in equal times. What this means is that the planet has to go slower when it's farther away from the sun and closer and sorry and faster when it's closer so between a and b the planet has to move more quickly than it moves between c and d in order that the area in gray is equal to the area in yellow this law has implications about the speed of of a body in general as it moves along uh, the surface one important thing to remember is that when you're on the major axis the velocity when you're close to the Sun is is faster proportional to that the distance that you are there to when you're on the other side as far away from the Sun as possible so for example if your orbit takes you in to a distance of half an AU at its closest and out to 2 AU at its farthest you'll be moving four times as fast at half an AU as you are at 2 AU the third law says that the squares of the orbital periods in years are equal to the cubes of the semi-major axis length measured in units of the Earth-Sun distance. We write this as p squared, p is the, the period of the orbit, is equal to a cubed, where a is the semi-major axis. Note that this compares the behavior of planets in different orbits, where the second law compares the behavior of planets along their individual orbits. So here's a diagram of the solar system with the actual the actual periods and distances for the innermost planets and in fact if you t take the p squared equals a cubed law and apply it to these planets you will find that it works very very well. In fact the same p squared equals a cubed phenomenon or p squared is proportional to a cubed works for the moons of Jupiter as we'll see when we talk about those uh, a little bit later on.